Hare Krishna, everyone. Welcome to uh, this very special edition of the Harry Krishna's in Britain podcast. This is episode number 59. We've got quite a few special editions um, happening at the moment. Uh, uh, we've got some, some, some wonderful guests taking part in the podcast at the moment. Uh, the Harry Krishna's in Britain podcast is put to you by the Harry Krishna Project, which is a national initiative that seeks to share the philosophy of Krishna consciousness with ordinary everyday people in, in Great Britain and beyond. And as you know, we're kind of, we've developed a reputation for being very straight talking, no hidden agenda. Uh, and on this podcast, we like to talk about the real issues. Uh, and we definitely will be talking about some big real issues this evening on, on episode number 59. Um, I'll explain in a moment why we can't particularly see uh, our guest's face, but we've got a beautiful uh, picture, as you can see in the other screen, of, of their lordships, um, uh, Radha Krishna, uh, who, who have joined us for the podcast uh, this evening. So I'd really like to welcome our guest, uh, Paranjana. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Um, thank you so much for... Um, for getting in touch and for uh, wanting to come and share your story uh, with with viewers, listeners in Britain um, and around the world. Um, and as we go through this podcast, you'll see you'll all discover quite soon, I guess, the reason why Parinjana isn't showing his face and why he's kind of remaining to some extent, uh, making sure his face isn't on the Internet. Uh, so, Parinjana, let's just kick off. Uh, by you telling us a bit about yourself and where you're from. Well, I was originally uh, born in Buffalo, New York. Later on, I ended up in Los Angeles, and I had at the time a 1956 Chevrolet, so kind of dates me for that point of view. And I, I saw the devotees for the first time on uh, Sunset Boulevard. And I just stopped my car right in the middle of the road and I just jumped out and I says, whatever this is, I'm going to do this. What is this? And they gave me their card. And I went to the temple on La Cienega Boulevard. We had a little house there. And I met a real nutty guy named Kanu Priya. And he, he said, oh, you can't join here. We don't have any room. If you want to join, you have to go to San Francisco. <laughs> so I, I did. I drove to San Francisco to join there. Which was good fortune because I didn't know it, but Prabhupada was was coming there. So I was able to see Prabhupada for the first time there. And uh, that was on uh, 518 Frederick Street. It's it's still a place where I go uh, regularly. You know, it's like my Tirtha to go by and, and see that place. So uh, I was sitting across the street. I couldn't go in the temple. It was so packed out. And... Um, Prabhupada came out and he just kept looking at me and I just said, oh, this is this person's going to be my guru. <laughs> so um, anyway, later Prabhupada asked for people to come to India and I volunteered and I went to India and spent like two years there, which was good for me because I learned a lot about Prabhupada's uh, God brothers and just how he deals with things on a practical level. So it was very uh, instructive for me. And uh, but I, I I got sick there towards the end. And so I, I had to go back to the West. So I was going to go back to the United States. I ended up going to uh, Great Britain. And uh, I went to the London Temple on, on Bury Place. And the Bury Place devotee said, hey, why don't you stay here? Why, why not just, you know, hang out in England? So I, I did that. And then later Prabhupada came there and he personally requested me to stay in England. So I did stay there uh, until 1979. So I did spend some time there in the English Yatra. And I, I know a lot of the old devotees uh, like Mohan and uh, Rahini Nandan and Vachitavirya and Ranchar and Sri Bhuvanath, those kinds of people. I don't know how many of them are even left anymore. But uh, but anyway, so that that was my uh, kind of experience going to England, and that's how I ended up there. So you you mentioned that uh, you you were driving along the road and you saw the devotees out chanting, uh, just kind of rewinding here, and you got out of your car and you you said, "Oh, 
or you said something like whatever it is I'm joining um what 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 was going on in your life at that point in terms of you know were you looking for something spiritual had you had a religious upbringing you know what what was it about the devotees that really appealed to you it's it's very hard to uh explain something like that um i was in a hippie shop and i saw a, a picture from england i mean i'm sorry from india of krishna you know petting a cow and i said oh what is that so uh, right away i was attracted i i would say to krishna so I don't know. I, I think the only explanation is that I was previously doing something or other with Krishna somehow or other, and I, I fell off the trail <laughs> mm. badly. Uh, but Krishna wanted me to reconnect to the path. So I, I just was immediately attracted. And this was it. the late 1960s, was it? It was. This was 1970. 1970. Okay. Early, early 1970, yeah. So uh, there's no good explanation, you know, logical explanation. But I, I believe there was some past connection that I had with Krishna, which which must have been there for some reason or other. And Krishna wanted to facilitate me to carry on, and and he did. He made mm. an arrangement. Mm. Mm. I was wow. just immediately attracted. I just said, "This is it. I got to do this." <laughs> so. And I did, yeah. And so you were uh, you were personally initiated by Prabhupada himself in 1970. Um, yeah. What What yeah. was that like? What was the experience like? Well, um, it's kind of it was kind of a funny experience because he gave me the name Paranjan, which nobody even knew what it meant at the time. So I said, Prabhupada, what is Paranjan? And Prabhupada says, oh, he was a king, and you'll find out everything later on. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Is, is this good or bad? <laughs> I'm going to find out everything later on. So later on, the story came out. The Bhagavatams were printed. The story of King Paranjana. So I, I just read it and reread it and kept re, you know, just restudying that story. And there's a lot of very interesting uh you know information about the intimate relationship of a disciple with the guru you know pranjan's wife was like his guru and and so on but at the end of the story it says when the spiritual master departs there will be chaos in the name of swamis and yogis or you know something like that i'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing but I was worried. I said, uh, well, wait a minute. My name is Pranjan. After Prabhupada departs, there's going to be chaos. There's going to be bogus swamis and yogis floating around. Am I going to be involved with this chaos? I mean, so I kept asking, has anybody else got the name Pranjan? Uh, no. You're, you're the, you're the, oh, no. <laughs> this could be bad news because I might be involved in you know, dealing with the chaos. And, and and so when the chaos started, I was prepared. I said, oh, yeah, okay, well, that's that's my name. I'm Pranjan. I'm going to deal with the chaos. That's why I got this thing. And you will find out everything later. Yeah, you'll find out these, these gurus were not appointed. You'll find out all kinds of things. And I did find it out. You know. The one so thing I wanted to find out was Prabhupada saying or discussing about him, himself being being poisoned I, I i saw this in a conversation book it said conversation about poison in hindi and i says what you know i got to get this tape so i prayed to krishna this was in 1990 uh, when the conversations books were first published only a thousand editions were, were published uh, but i but i got a copy and so it said in there, you know, conversation about poison. So I I just knew I had to get this tape. So I kept praying to Krishna, please get me this tape. And he did. You know, in 1997, a devotee came up and says, here's the tapes. Don't tell anybody where you got them from. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got that. So I did find out everything later, just as he said would happen. So Prabhupada was being quite um, prophetic uh a kind of a um it was kind of a prophecy i guess a sign of of things to come when he gave you the name paranjan well um, it seems that way i mean does mm -hmm. anybody have a better explanation i don't know but that that's how it seems 
to me that that things just kept falling into my hands you know the appointment tape the letters the poison tape you know it's it just like some mystical thing you know that's that that happened spontaneously or automatically or because it was destined to happen i don't know so let's maybe come back to the poison tape later uh let's just briefly go back to the 1970s uh so you were in the uk from 1973 to 79 right. uh did you did you live at a temple did you did you have a family here what were you kind of doing in those six years in the uk well um i i got married in in 73 to ishwari dasi who was um uh, a, a cockney girl <laughs> and we had a, a child and we were staying at the manor, but I was staying on and off the property. You know, I was sometimes living in the, in the, uh, uh, what do they call them? The government housing thing, you know? Social, it used to be called council housing. It's now called social yeah, council, housing. Yeah. Council yeah. housing. Yeah. We lived in the council housing. I rented a storefront for a while in Islington and uh, lived there for a while. So uh, I was on and off. Uh, the property you know and it, it would be just too complicated to you know cover every single move that I made mm, but mm. but I was you know on and off and I was you know basically connected to the manor you know and the devotees at the manor and uh, that's where I you know associated with devotees most of the time was at the manor mm, mm. okay so um I'm I'm kind of um I'm gonna kind of I guess move us on to kind of the main thing we're gonna we're going to talk about today but I'm I'm guess I'm trying to kind of stretch out kind of so Prabhupada left the planet physically in 1977 you left right. the, you you left the UK in 1979 uh right. what what were your what was happening in in uh if in the Krishna consciousness movement in, in Britain or, or elsewhere in that, in that period, in the late seventies, early eighties, tell us a bit about some of the things that were happening. Well, in, in 1978, the, the GBC declared that Jai Tirtha was the Acharya of England. And so right away, I didn't agree. I said, I don't think so. You know, Jai Tirtha had been involved in some scandal of having an affair in uh, Los Angeles and he had moved to England maybe to avoid you know repercussions from that affair so he, he had a, a reputation in, in LA for being kind of a loose caboose <laughs> so how, how did he become an Acharya I just didn't believe it you know and I didn't believe any of them could be Acharyas because you know Prophet had said so many discouraging things about the GBC over the years they're not following they're not listening they're not you know, they're not following the regulatory principles. He, he, he made comments like that all, all, all the time about the GBC. So I didn't believe that Jai Chirtha was the Acharya. So uh, Bhagavan was kicking out a bunch of devotees from, his, from the farm in uh, France. Some of them were coming to England. They were like refugees. I, I actually had to go to the Paris train station at one time with couple thousand pounds of money to give to the stranded refugees they were just stranded at the train station with nothing you know Bhagavan just dropped off you know like 50 people at the train station with nothing and they had babies and everything else so there was like a purge going on you know and I knew that I would be purged eventually <laughs> so but there was a an incident where one lady Kamala Kanti took her baby back from the farm in France to England. And then her husband kidnapped the baby back to France. Jai Tirtha deputed me to go get the baby. I went and got the baby. It was like a two-year-old toddler girl. And when I brought her to the customs in England, they knew right away, this is the baby. Yeah, I didn't need any papers or a passport or a birth certificate. They just, they knew this baby. So this was in all the newspapers. You can research this that this baby had been kidnapped. And my picture was in the photo, it was in the newspapers also, you know, that I had come to, you know, rescue the baby. 
So there was a lot of chaos going on. They were kicking out people. So basically, you had to accept them as gurus or you were out. You know, so they confronted me. Finally, they they made Jaitirtha a sannyas. After he had fallen down, he was taking drugs. He was having sex. There was actually a photo of him, you know, having an affair with this woman. And so I said, look, he's ha he's offering LSD to the Shalagram deity. He's having illicit sex with the followers. He is not an Acharya. <laughs> You know, that is not possible. And uh, Jayapataka and Bhagavan and Ramachara and Jayatirtha, they called me in. They said, look, he's an Acharya. And if you don't accept that, uh, we'll make you the guru of Ireland. So that's the deal. You become the guru of Ireland, you work with us, or you're out. And they also showed me some papers. They had had conversations with Sridhar Maharaj, B.R. Sridhar Maharaj. And Sridhar Maharaj says, none should protest. None should protest. We, we can't disturb the faith of the followers. And they says, look, Sridhar Maharaj is 100% is on our side. Don't protest. You're protesting. You're a troublemaker. He does not approve of that either. You know, so I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, but I'm going to protest because Prabhupada always protested false gurus. I mean, it was one thing I saw in India when I was there for two years. Prabhupada constantly, chronically complained about bogus gurus and swamis and yogis and avatars. <laughs> this is, wow, you know, this is right. You know, I'm, I'm Paranjan, and now that Prabhupada's gone, here's the chaos, and these guys are the, are the chaos. These are the cause of the chaos. They're trying to make false swamis, yogis, and avatars. So I'm not going to go along with this. So I left. And, uh, well, I had to leave, really. That's what happened. But Jai Tirtha did tell me, watch your back. You know, he made that very clear. Watch your back. You know, don't be a protester. Don't make waves. Don't cause trouble for us. Or that will be trouble for you. So it was a very intense kind of situation. And people keep saying, well, Jai Tirtha was a nice guy. Yeah, but not, watch your back <laughs> is not a nice thing to tell a, another devotee. I mean, who who says stuff like that? Mm. So he he got carried away, you know. And he called my wife into his room one day, and he he said, "You got to give up on your husband. Your husband's not surrendered." And, you know. So my wife just said, uh, "Oh my God, I, I hope he he flies a kite in a rainstorm, and and the lightning, you know, knocks some sense into his brain." <laughs> I, I find it quite just surreal that you were uh, kind of senior gurus in ISKCON at the time offered you the position of the to be the guru of Ireland or or leave ISKCON and and I love the fact that you stuck to your principles and your values and you turned that, that position down and you just told them where to go and left I, I love that yeah yeah well uh, I mean I could see the writing on the wall this was going to end up bad you know because Prabhupada had told us so many times the history of the Gaudiya Math, that you know they made false gurus and there was beatings and murders and all kinds of problems, you know. In 1936, you know, Sridhar Maharaj made a false guru and people were protesting. And Prabhupada told us the story. You know, people had, had their heads bashed in with bricks, they had their skulls cracked, people had their faces pushed into dog stools. Because they they didn't want to you know worship this Anantavasade guru person, so they were dissenting. So I, I realized my position is very similar to the 1936 dissenters. I'm I'm going to have my head cracked in with bricks if I'm not careful. Mm. Because this is just history repeating. Not only repeating, they went to the founder of the 1936 deviation. They went to Sridhar Maharaj, who is the founding father of the Anantavasade deviation. <laughs> I says well, this, this is not adding up very well for me. You know, look what happened to the dissenters in the thirties. Some of them were killed. You know, and they went to Sridhar. Some newspaper reporter went to Sridhar and says, "Well, wh why is there murders going on in, in your uh, devotee movement? I thought your devotees were all peaceful, vegetarian people." And Sridhar says, "Well, have you not read Bhagavad Gita? There was a big war. People got killed." 
what? <laughs> like, what the heck is that? What is that? I got to get killed? Why do I got to get killed? What, what's, what's he talking about? You know, I, I'm in a Bhagavad Gita war and I'm going to get killed for, for what? I, I, you know, I've never understood these. He made these statements. It just never made any sense to me. Except, you know, the only thing I understood was I'm in danger. <laughs> like a lot of danger from these people. Can we talk a bit about, um, I mean, there's so much we could talk about today. Uh, I think you and I could chat for hours and we, we can record the biggest podcast ever recorded. Uh, but I want it maybe <laughs> to start, <laughs> um, maybe we'll do several editions, but I really want to maybe move forward to talk about some of these court cases uh, or, or sure. lawsuits. And we could maybe start with, I've just got up the email that you sent me to make sure I'm factually correct. If if you want, I mean, my I've, I'll read the question so the viewers and listeners know the question, but we can maybe start talking about 1986 or where, however you want to address this question, I'm, I'm really happy. So the, the question uh, is, uh, you have been involved uh, with some of the biggest court cases against ISKCON over the last 40 years. <laughs> Um, having yeah. successfully had them sued four times. Um, tell us a bit about each case, what they were about, and uh, how much was this gone sued for and why? So we can you can answer that in how you want, or we can start with 1986, however that works for you. Okay. Well, one thing is, yeah, we, we might want to do a, a, several of these uh, conversations because you know it's just it's a lot of stuff to compress in the one time I, I was just interviewed by tv and they put it into four hour segments but anyway so in 1986 there was a, a lady who whose sons had been molested in tamal's gurukula and uh she was very distraught about that so i says what let's get a lawyer let's sue tamal we, we you know Let's get some money for your boys. Your boys were were harmed by by Tamal, and so we did. We, we we went and got a lawyer, and we sued Tamal. And uh, this was in '86, you know, and we won, you know, easily. It was like a three million dollar settlement, but that exposed right there that there was a molesting problem going on, and then they they moved the molester to another you know temple or something like that and the police found out about it and he got into trouble and the, the temple got into trouble so it was a big a big headache for tamal you know uh, so but just, he, he, everybody knew at the time hey there's a molesting problem because this is th three million dollars is nothing to joke about at that in 86 that that's like 30 million dollars now mm, mm. so just so because I, I don't know anything or much about this court case at all. This was, it was Tamil Krishna himself? Well, was the abuser we sued, or we sued the, the, the Iskan Dallas, which is called, I think it's called the Texas Krishnas or something like that. So, yeah. I mean, he sued Tamal individually and, and Iskan because, you know, Iskan was moving the molester, Iskan was helping Tamal. It wasn't just Tamal himself. The whole operation was was assisting. Mm. In this and, and so just so kind of I, I fully understand, Tamal Krishna uh, was the abuser. No, 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 no. One of the people on his farm. Okay, was the okay, okay. But he was orchestrating the whole thing, and he kicked this woman out. When this woman complained about her children being molested, he just kicked her out on the street after she had collected a half a million dollars for Iskon. She kicked her out on the street without a penny. And I said, no, we're going to get you a couple million dollars. You're not, you're not going to be penniless. That's ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, we won that lawsuit. So that was the first lawsuit. But, you know, it was known then that there was a molesting problem. Now, was around the same time, I was working with Salochan, and we were exposing molesting going on all over the place in New Vrindavan, in L.A., in Mayapur, and we were writing about that. And so Lochan was interviewing women whose children had been molested. So th they realized, wow, this is just going to, this is going to keep spiraling on, you know. So, so, so Lochan is going to help create another lawsuit for us. 
So that's why they had to get rid of him. And they would have gotten rid of me. You know, the FBI was tapping their phones and they said, hey, they're, they're sending out three hit men to get you. So the FBI informed the Berkeley police. The Berkeley police put a tail on me. And when the three goons came, they were chasing me down the street. The Berkeley police got on the loudspeaker of the car and says, everybody freeze. <laughs> so Iskan was very aware that, you know, we we were on a roll. We were after their molesting process. And this could become a lawsuit. It did, and did because we had already won the lawsuit by that time, the, the Dallas one. So anyway, so that was the first lawsuit. And then later on, around 1995, I was writing my newsletter. <clears throat> and I was talking about the molesting. And I was talking about the suicides, you know, the suicides of the victims and all kinds of things. And so some devotees called me and said, hey, why don't we just sue ISKCON and make a class action and get a bunch of kids involved and let's take them down. We can't have this suicide thing going on. So, uh, you know, some friends of mine got uh, Wendell Turley law firm to take the case. But then I was distributing information how to sign up for the case. I put a thing in my newsletter, you know, this is where you sign up. But I was in L.A. at that time. And I was just walking down the street, handing out papers to the guru coolies saying, here, sign up, get it, get some money. Yeah. So I was getting people to sign up right there, right on the street in L.A. <laughs> and that was a $400 million lawsuit. And uh, it was the same thing. You know, they, they lost. They, they had to plead no contest, no contest. Uh, in part because I was going to come there. You know, the lawyer said, look, I don't want even want to do this case unless you agree you're going to come here and testify. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm coming. I'll be there. Yeah. I really want to talk about this a bit because $400 million right. is half a, almost half a billion dollars, I think. I mean, I'm terrible at math. Right. Right. And this was, right. 25, this was 25 years ago, 26 right. years ago. So the value was even more in that in that sense uh, -huh. uh so tell us a bit more about that court case you talked it was a it was suing iscon yeah for all the child abuse and the molestation is that and and you had a lot of um victims came forward to testify right. yeah that's right yeah they 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 had uh, i think originally um 500 kids signed up, something like that. And and the lawyer thought it was going to be maybe 500, but then another 500 wanted to sign up, and then another 1,000 wanted to sign up. So there was like 2,000 victims, probably. But they had to cut it down because they knew that ISCON didn't have, you know, $100 million. So they just cut, they were trying to cut it down to 500, uh, you know, victims. So a lot of kids who wanted to sign up weren't weren't allowed to sign up because they you know there was just numerically not enough money to do that you know. I mean, I just find that phenomenal in the sense that it, not Iskon had to then find that money from somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, and you know, I've 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 been around the Krishna Conscious Movement in the UK for about twenty years and. Uh, when I, not sure, I don't want to say too much on the podcast, but when I was serving in a particular program in the UK, I did a lot of fundraising for this program, this particular program I was involved with. And I raised 15, 15 grand, 10 to 15 grand, of which yeah. half of which I never saw or, or kind of went missing. And it was spent on stuff that wasn't meant to be spent on. And part, mm. I was always told from the get-go, from the beginning, well, make out that we're really poor, or make out that we're hippies, make out that we have no money, make out that we're poor monks, and we do this and we do that. And that worked. It did work in terms of getting money for ISCON, but actually ISCON isn't a poor organization in the UK. If you look at the charity in the UK now, today, if you look at the Charity Commission website, the annual income is £12 million. Pounds. You know, mm -hmm. that that's that's I mean, there's, of course, there's bigger charities, but that's that's 12 million. And they employ 180 staff. That's not a small, helpless little kind of startup from the back of your garden, is it? it, it it's something much greater. So, oh, I mean, yeah. that that's my so I completely um, 
kind of agree. I mean, that kind of 400, I'm, I have to, I'm going to keep saying that to myself, $400 million ISKCON was sued for. Uh, and did ISKCON pay up? Well, <laughs> it's funny. I was in LA at the time, okay? And I was riding my bike around in front of the temple, handing out papers. And, and they, the leaders, were all congregated in front of the temple. They had regular meetings there with their lawyer, with all of them. And needless to say, they weren't very happy with me riding <laughs> my bike around. <laughs> Let's just say. And it's funny, too, because the police, you know, the Los Angeles police, they would come by in their the cop car, you know. And they would turn on their lights and, and turn on their siren and pull and pull me over on my bike, you know. And they would say, "You idiot! You got to get out of here! Don't you know these people want to kill you? What are you doing here?" You know. But uh, I, I think their lawyers told them, "Don't, don't talk to me because you know anything you say can can and will be used against you." But they hired the top notch best lawyers in San Fernando Valley. I mean, they hired the million dollar you know, prize lawyers to uh, fight their case. And they, so they declared themselves bankrupt. And then they started hiding assets. They started, you know, they took uh, different temples out of the name of ISKCON and started different charities. They started the big shell game of corporations, you know. But, but I mean, they were getting a lot of legal advice. So, you know, they, the, their lawyers were managing all these paperwork around, you know shift this property to here and shift this to there and shift this asset here and you know they did a lot so in the end the, the bottom line is the the guru coolies didn't get a lot of money i think the top person got like twenty five thousand dollars something like that most of them got five six thousand dollars you know because this kind of very successfully you know was able to uh, pull the wool over the the court you know with their lawyer with their top-notch lawyers but, but you must have also had a good lawyer in order to you know win a court case and and win a well window turley had already sued the catholic church he had sued the, the u.s army over their bad helicopters i mean this he, he didn't need the money he, he was already a, a multi-millionaire mm. You know, but but he just he felt bad for the kids. He says this is horrible. He says these kids are killing themselves. We can't we can't have that. You know, so he did it pro bono. You know, he didn't he did not do it for the money. He did it because he genuinely felt concerned for the victims. Mm. Kind of going off topic slightly. Does Iscon? Are you aware that Iscon in the United States has a large property portfolio? Um. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's if you can find which ISKCON you're talking about. You know, like in like in Alachua, they have something like 312 corporations down there. Mm. And which is ISKCON, which is, and some of the directors of this charity are the directors of the other charity. They're wearing 10 different hats. I mean, it would be very hard to find where ISKCON's actual money is, you know, is lodged in the first place. It reminds me uh, a little bit of the Church of Scientology, uh, oh, yeah. which uh, yeah. which yeah. which is uh, very few people actually attend and, and practice Scientology, uh, but they are a big property development company and uh, they own a lot of property uh, in not only in the US but the UK and that's how they they keep themselves running as an organization their property portfolio. Um, well, the Mormon Church has an eighty billion dollar portfolio. Mm. Yeah. So this is, but anyway, <laughs> the bottom line is the, the, the children didn't get much out of the deal, but at least they got something. And some of them were living homeless, you know, living in their cars right around the temple. So at least they got enough money to get another car or, you know, get something. I just find it, maybe, maybe I shouldn't find it astonishing anymore, but part of me, a big part of me still finds it mm -hmm. astonishing that, you know, that you 2000, you say 2000, victims came forward and said yeah. that they were they were sexually abused in iscon right just find that phenomenal just unbelievable well, that was two thousand out of four thousand it was just... only four thousand kids so that's fifty percent fifty percent you know so when when anutima says this is like the catholic church no the catholic church is like two or three percent 50% is way, way beyond the Catholic Church. 
but now an interesting thing also happened at the same time that you know we were suing them over the molesting we were also suing them over the bbt copyrights okay and they lost that case that was like another two or three million dollars and simultaneously they started a case at the same exact time against the bangalore temple uh, they they started suing Madhu Pandit. That cost them twenty million dollars. So you you see now why I'm blamed, and I helped Bangalore with paperwork for their court case and testimony. So the Jai Bataka people, uh, shortly after that, they said you, you're causing us a hundred million dollar loss <laughs> because I'm helping. You know, I helped the three million case, the four hundred million case the $20 million Bangalore case, the $3 million BBT case. Can, can you tell us a bit about those two other cases you mentioned? So so uh, uh, maybe the $20 million Bangalore case, in case anyone's not sure what that was about, if you could give us any details, that would be, that would be really good. Well, uh, the GPC started something called the GBC of West Bengal, which is actually an illegal organization. And then they wanted everybody in America to sign a paper of loyalty to the GBC of West Bengal, which is basically Jai Pataka. And uh, so the Bangalore devotees, they, they by that time realized, you know, there's all this molesting going on. There's all these problems going on. Do we want to be connected to that? No, we want Bangalore to be separate. So Madhu Panda, he came to LA when I was there. He met me. And he says, we're going to follow your idea. And my idea is people should just worship Prabhupada as the Acharya and not Jayapataka. So the the GBC started a lawsuit against Madhu Pandit, which ended up costing them $20 million, which, which they've had all kinds of problems with their court case. You know, they were caught later on uh, submitting fraudulent documents into the court, they stole a picture out of the Bangalore temple and, and they sent it to a judge and, you know, to try to, you know, convince the judge that Bangalore had sent the photo, but it was them and it was proven later on to be them. And, but Di Diorama was a big leader of that. And he, he's now become very, very sick. He, he needs dialysis all the time. And he said he's tired of this lawsuit. Well, yeah, he's tired because, you know, he just keeps asking for another million, another million, you know. And then, uh, you know, Jai Pataka said, I need a million. This was like two and a half, three, three years ago. He says, and, and I need another million for my lawsuits. So they sent Bhakti Charu to collect for the lawsuits. And he was promising people he would give a little deity of Prabhupada if you gave money for the lawsuit. But I, I don't know a single person who ever got the little deity. <laughs> Basically, it was a scam, you know. But he died. You know, he came here to collect money, and he uh, he got COVID, and he he departed. So uh, on many levels, it's not ending up well for them because of all these court cases. But that that's kind of in a nutshell the Bangalore yeah. case, and I, I, I don't see them winning the, the case like ever. You know? And which which year was the Bangalore case? The twenty million dollars. Which year was now, that? It started around 97. 97, I started the, the child molesting uh, lawsuit. 97, we started the BBT lawsuit. And the Bangalore lawsuit started. All these lawsuits started at the same time. Around the same time. Okay, okay. And I was supposedly, or I was one of the ringleaders of all, all these court cases. So uh, obviously not very popular with these people. So are you like a trained lawyer yourself or do you have any training in the, in law? No, I have no training in anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know basic right from wrong. And I do know that when kids are, are killing themselves, you, you got to do something, you know. And I, and I know that Bangalore, yeah, why does Bangalore want to be lumped in with the $400 billion lawsuit people? Mm. I, I wouldn't want to be part of that either. Yeah, and, so and the okay. devotees and so, so so everyone's kind of clear who are watching listening the devotees in bangalore wanted to and still do follow a how do i explain this or say this iskon bangalore is, is a separate entity from uh wider iskon or other iskon um 
and follow a different words are very difficult kind of philosophical strand um mm -hmm. i'm not sure that's the way to put it you know I, i'm trying not necessarily to use the word ritvik because and then you use the word interpretation uh interpretation of a letter uh <laughs> a number of people i know who follow the ritvik order of not not in an aggressive way but then have bitten my head off and say well it's not an interpretation it's just what the letter says. So I'm trying to ask kind of like someone who works in the media and journalism. I'm just trying to be as objective as possible. And words are yeah. very words are very difficult. Well, I, I, I call the, those kind of people the Prabhupada Anugas. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Just 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 to make it simple, I, I was calling myself a Prabhupada Anuga before I even had the Ritvik tape. So you know, I, my idea was. Prabhupada had always said that there's only going to be a GBC, there's not going to be gurus, don't go to the Gaudiya Ma, don't make another bunch of bogus gurus. So it's pretty clear to me that he would continue to be the Acharya, and he had his Murtis established in, in, in the temples. And he also said over and over again, don't change anything. So I, I had all that going for me before we had the Ritvik letter. Or, the, the, the Ritvik letter wasn't even circulated. It wasn't, you know, all this stuff was covered up. The letters were covered up. The tape was, the, the appointment tape was covered up. The Rithic letter was, all that was covered up. But I just knew automatically, no, they're not gurus. Yes, we have to worship Prabhupada. End of story. Let's, um, uh, I knew we would talk about so many things on this podcast. Let, let's talk a bit now. We <laughs> talked about it before I, hit the record button, but let's talk a bit and now about 1983 and, and onwards. And um, just so um, the viewers and listeners kind of understand the context. So uh, in ISKCON, uh, the system is that Prabhupada is the founder of Charya of ISKCON and uh, the GBC is the ruling managing authority of ISKCON. And what ISKCON does and has done since probably the late 1970s is allow other um people to initiate uh and i think if you look at the iscon the official iscon website there's around 85 86 people mostly all men maybe there's two or three women now that are allowed mm -hmm. to initiate so the official position in iscon so everyone's clear is that they are accepting disciples for themselves uh um, um and uh that is that is the main theological practice within ISKCON. Uh, they're kind of, con uh, they would say they're continuing a line, a kind of parampara, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think even in ISKCON now, I mean, it's, what is it, 2023? It's 40, I'm terrible at maths, 46 years since Prabhupada left the planet. Uh, I think we're now on the third or fourth generation down of sannyasis in ISKCON. Uh, I mean, the most ob obvious, not the right word, the most the obvious one I can think of is Prabhupada. His disciple was Jay, uh, Jayadvaita. Jayadvaita gave sannyas to uh, Kanama, Kanama Kanana, uh, who's now left his body. But before he did, he gave sannyas to Sutapa, who's now uh, uh, Keshava Maharaj. So that's kind of the fourth, third or fourth generation. Uh, and at some point, I'm sure Iskand will allow Keshava uh, Swami, Keshava Maharaj, uh, to initiate. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, so that's the official position in ISKCON. However, there's another um, strand or another uh, group of Prabhupada followers uh, that would recognize a letter that Prabhupada wrote on uh, July the 9th, 1977, to um, be a letter that indicates how ISKCON should operate for the future, that there should be no more initiating gurus after Prabhupada, and Prabhupada is the kind of is the Diksha Guru for all time. I think, and, and, and there are a number of people, and I would say a growing number of people that are now following that uh, letter to the, to the T. I think, I think I've kind of summarized the Ritvik order in layman's terms. Um, and so, uh, okay, so that was 1977, Prabhupada wrote the letter around July 1977, Prabhupada left his body in uh, November 1977. Uh, and then uh, Purunjana, 
it, it, it's now going to tell us a bit about 1983, uh, because this idea, and sorry if I'm using words that people don't like or find offensive, this idea that Prabhupada is the Diksha guru of all time, everyone's guru, so on and so forth forever, uh, wasn't really talked about or practiced until what, the 80s, 83, 84? Um, well, yeah, I mean, in, in the early 80s, I started writing little pamphlets and papers, and uh, I didn't have the Ritvik letter, I didn't have the appointment tape, but I was just saying, the Acharya must be a pure devotee, the Acharya must be a resident of Krishna Loka, and these guys are clearly not on, on that position. So I wrote a paper called Our Living Guru, which is online, people can find it. And that was in 84. So, uh, yeah, my idea was people have to worship a pure devotee. But now there's another thing that a lot of people don't realize. What what I told Jai Pataka in 1979 was, don't you remember how many times Prabhupada told us, do not let anyone touch your feet? He stopped the whole care time once when he saw two girls getting their feet touched. He says, and he stood up and he says, I told you, don't let anybody touch your feet. You'll be taking their sins. You'll be acting like a guru. You'll get sick. You'll fall down. You'll suffer. Don't do that ever. And, and he told us that over and over. So I says, look, we can't take sins. We can't be Diksha gurus and take sins. Jesus can take sins. We're not Jesus. Hello? You know, so if you take sins, you'll have to suffer. And Jai Pataka laughed at me and he says, I'm going to take sins from 50,000 people. Oh, OK. Well, how is that working out for him? Right now? <laughs> how's that going? <laughs> yeah, how's it going, dude? You know, you thought I was joking because you thought Prabhupada was joking. And look what happened. So a lot of them just went insane. I mean, on top, you know, on top of everything else. I mean, Jai Tirtha just went insane. That's that's all there is to it. Satsuru, look at his art. Look at the way he writes. He's writing about the gopis and he's writing about his constipation in the same pages of the same book. Who, who does that? So these are the uh, reactions, you know. And, and I have a good friend who is a disciple of Satsuru and he's still faithful to Satsuru. And he says, well, yeah, Satsuru took our sins and that's why he has all these problems. Yeah, but who told them to take the sins? Who told him he's another Jesus? You know, <laughs> I, I have a friend who was a nurse in, uh, in Bellevue Hospital many years ago. And it's a mental home. And he says, at any given time, there's two Jesus in the Bellevue. Two guys who think they're Jesus, okay. And then there's also a couple of guys who think they're Hitler, a couple of guys think they're Mussolini. And he says, inevitably, the Hitlers and the Jesus start fighting <laughs> in the mental home, you know. So, yeah, you, you, we neophytes cannot take sins. Prabhupada told us, don't let anyone touch your feet. He told us that repeatedly in India because we had these Pondo programs, you know, like a tent. And we would walk up on this platform and all these little old ladies would try to touch our feet, you know. And so Prabhupada says, uh, if they touch your feet, you touch their head immediately and give give back the karma because you, if you take the karma, you, you'll get... Uh, severe reaction for that. You can't do that. And so we said, well, Prabhupada, what about if it's a woman? He says, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Touch their head back. Don't 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 take their sins. But what we did, we made the platform much wider so that you know people couldn't touch our feet. But this is an important aspect that very few devotees even have any clue about. You know, so Kadambakana, people were writing, well he took our sins and he's suffering. Yeah, that's right. You're right. But who told him he was Jesus? Who said that? And why did he think that? He's qualified to take other people's sins. This is called the illusion. You are not Jesus. And if you do think you're Jesus, you belong in Bellevue. That's where you belong. <laughs> it's very simple, really. Neophytes can only, you know, give shiksha. They can give instructions, but they cannot take the sins of another, a conditioned soul cannot absorb the sins of another conditioned soul. And if he does, 
he will go down. Now, one time I was with Jai Tirtha. This was in 84, maybe. We were both in Atreya Reach's house in San Francisco. Very narrow stairway. So I had to pass by Jai Tirtha as he passed. We were just like one foot away from each other. When he went past me, my life air was just sucked right out of me. Poof. I couldn't breathe. And there, there's a reason. The reason is he is surrounded by a giant black ball of sins that he's taken from disciples. And I felt it when he went by me. It took my life out. So he's covered with that. And Satsarub went to a psychic, famous psychic in, in uh, Washington State, a lady. But he put on a suit and tie. He didn't want this psychic lady to know that he is um, a Hare Krishna. But his servant told me the story. So he goes into the psychic and the psychic just stops and puts her hand up and says, stop, stop, don't come close to me. Sir, you're surrounded by a gigantic black ball of dark energy. I've never seen such darkness. You, sir, get a Yellow Pages phone book. Look up churches. You got to go to church immediately. <laughs> so, yeah, you can't be a Diksha Guru. You are a neophyte. The, the, the Uttama, and Prabhupada explained this, the Uttama Adhikari has what's called Brahmana Tejas. Tejas means a fire. So the sins of the followers do not ever attach to the Uttama because, you know, the fire burns it off. But if you don't have that fire, it will affect you. And it has affected them. Look how many of them fell, fell down, got sick, and went crazy and died. And just died prematurely. You know, Suhotra was just sitting and poof, he just fell over dead. Gorgovinda was just sitting, fell over dead. Uh, Bhakti Tirtha Swami, severe melanoma, dead. You know, this is very serious. They don't understand this. You don't have that tejas. You can't burn those sins. Those sins will accumulate on you and you will take them with you into the next life. Mm, mm. Okay, so the nineteen so nineteen eighty four, um, you were writing about uh, this whole concept, this idea of being uh, 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 followers of the Ritvik order um, of, the, of particularly of the July 9th, nineteen seventy seven letter. No, um, no, in 84, it, well, in 84, we got the tape and we started to realize at the time. But no, prior to 84, we didn't have the Ritvik information. We were so just it, telling people worship Prabhupada because these people mm -hmm. are not qualified to be Acharyas. And he is. So Acharya Upasanam, you have to take shelter of the Acharya. He is the Acharya. Do not take shelter of these people. The Ritvik idea was gradually, you know, weaned out over time when when the letter became available the tape mm. became available that was in the probably 86 87 88 when when nichananda started his vedic village review and the ritvik order was more discussed at that time but mm. initially initially we didn't have this information so this is i mean potentially you know 1986 87 this was almost 10 years after the right. letter was was written and after you know the last audio recording of Prabhupada's voice uh right. that talks about the arrangements for for initiation after he's left the planet so where had the letter and the tape been for almost a decade where were they kind of hidden well the gbc just didn't circulate them i mean for example uh the will you know Prabhupada's will we didn't have the will, but I had a friend who, who broke into Hansa Duda's safe, okay, in Berkeley, and in the safe was a copy of the will. And in the safe was a copy of the Topanga conversations where Tamal said we were only appointed as Ritviks. You know, there was a transcript of that, and that was made in 1980. The Topanga conversations, you know, it was Jayadveda and Hansa Duda and Tamal and uh, I don't know, a bunch of leaders at the time. On the tape, on, on that uh, Topanga conversation, they said we were only appointed as Ritviks. 
but it wasn't being circulated. So I got a hold of that Topanga conversation and the will. And then Rita Ananda came to Berkeley and I says, oh, look at the will. It doesn't appoint any gurus. And, and, and Rita Ananda immediately says, where did you get that from? You know, <laughs> that, that's when they realized there's a leak. You know, somebody leaked it out. They didn't want it leaked out. They definitely didn't want the appointment tape leaked out. So they were trying to suppress all these all these documents. We got the letters on a microfiche. We we had to go out and buy a microfiche machine, which is like a giant machine. <laughs> you know, and so that's how I got a hold of that. And we started reading the letters. And microfiche is a tiny little, you know, photographic image of, of mm. those things. So that's how we started circulating the letters. None of the letters were being circulated. And in the letters, there's many instructions about how, you know, Kirtananda was falling down and you know, Prabhupada didn't trust the GBC and GBC, ABC, so many things are in those letters. They, they wanted to suppress all this. And, and and we were really a thorn in their side because we were publishing these documents and we were making a transcript of the appointment tape and all that stuff. So the Rific thing wasn't really, you know, it kind of it was like squeezing you know toothpaste out of a tube it just kind of gradually came out as the documents were surfacing and as more people began to discuss it but it, it took some time mm. Mm. i'm just kind of digesting all the info all this information that you're you're giving it's quite it's really fascinating and uh you know we're, <laughs> we're talking about so many issues that i wasn't expecting us to talk about particularly the kind of the ritvic order uh that's what the TV people just told me. This is this was going to be an hour. Then they says, "No, it's going to be another hour." Then I said, well, "Wait a minute, no." <laughs> yeah, yeah. This happened to me before. Yeah. So you, you, um, you, you've. I mean, I know we talked about this before with the kind of broadcast, but just so everyone's aware, you have been interviewed by a lot of the U.S. media on this particular oh, yeah. topic. You know, in terms of what you've experienced in 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 the Harry Christian movement in Iskon, the lawsuits. Just tell us about some of the media that you've been interviewed for. Well, um, especially after 1986, after Salotan was murdered, uh, and I was going to be next. I mean, the FBI put a tail on me and all the rest of it. So uh, the, the media got in touch with the police, and, and the police said, well, if you want to talk to one of the friends of Salotan, you got to talk to this guy, me, Tim, Tim Lee. So they got a hold of me, and uh, I was interviewed for the the book Monkey on a Stick by uh, Lindsay uh, Grusom. And, uh, you know, that was a big book. That came out in like 88, I think. And then I was also interviewed by CBS News Television. Uh, it, it was a show called 47th Street. It was J Jane Wallace. And Jane Wallace is famous uh, daughter of Mike Wallace. And, and and Jane Wallace, you know, she took me to a, a hotel room and she says, look, before I ask you anything, I need to show you something. I said, okay, go ahead. So she had made a film of Nuvendavan and there was Kirtananda sitting on a big golden seat and he was covered with the hands of maybe 25 little boys. They were all massaging Kirtananda, you know. And then she stopped the film and she says, now, I just want to ask you one question before we start. Is this pedophile heaven? Yes or no? I said, yeah, this, this is pedophile heaven. She says, oh, thank God. Thank God we met you. All the other people said, this is wonderful. This is divine. This is spiritual. You're the only one we've met so far who understands this is pedophile heaven. <laughs> so so anyway yeah she interviewed me and, and and she put that footage on her show of Kirtananda covered with the little boys I mean it was very obvious to any ordinary person you know what's going on here but even in 1980 you know when I, I first stopped in Berkeley after I got kicked out the Berkeley police came up to me and they says hey what's happening with this kind there was Prabhupada and then there was people who thought they were Prabhupada. Isn't that what happened? Yeah, that's what happened. Even they figured it out, the police. So for outside observers were able to see a lot, a lot of this. So, you know, so I was interviewed there. 
And then I was interviewed for a show called In Investigative Discovery Channel se several times uh, by those people. So, uh, and newspapers and, and books. Uh, you know, I, I've been working with Henry Doktorsky. He's been writing a whole history of Newman Davin, and I've helped him out with different details. Of, mm. well, I, I follow know. him on social media, and uh, at some yeah. point I'd like to interview him um, uh, for the podcast because he has yeah. a fantastic story to tell. Um, yeah. So in some, I, I, I've helped media over the years, and some of the things that I that I uh, said were, were published in Time magazine, Rolling Stone magazine, New York Times, things like that. Wow. But it all started with my picture being in the England newspaper, this guy rescued the baby. <laughs> so I, I started out being a media guy right, right from square one. Mm. Mm. And I, I love how you've kind of kept your, I mean, I don't know what you look like. Uh, and I, before our interview today, I tried to uh, find out what you look like on social media and couldn't find a picture of yourself. Uh, so you've been very clever at kind of, I mean, not, not completely anonymous because you've, you've your name's online, your, you know, legal well, name. Henry Doktorsky has, has published my, my photo in his books. If you really want to find an, an, old, <laughs> an, old, an old passport photo of me okay okay but, I, but try to visualize a person whose mother was born in 1917 okay your mother My mom was born, born in 1917 so figure it out from there well i i i i'm not really <laughs> sure how old you are but if you were driving a car in 1970 uh you might have been around 20 at the time at least 20 yeah. i'm 74 uh, i'm 74 now. 74 okay okay uh, I mean, you're you're uh, uh, not that age is any relevance, really, but you're probably one of the older Prabhupada disciples. Possibly. Yeah, I would, think, I would think so. Older surviving. Many of them are, are, are no, no longer here. There's there's this is a bit of a tangent now, but I have talked on this social media channel before the Hare Krishna project talk, talked about there's a lady in the UK who I believe might possibly be uh, the oldest Prabhupada disciple alive today. She is 88 Oh wow! And she, her name is Brahma Devi, and yeah. she uh, she was initiated in the United States in 1974, oh, okay. I think. I, I've, I've all of the, the 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 details from the interview I've got somewhere I've forgotten, but she now lives in South London, and her oh. son, who's um, around 66, is also a Prabhupada disciple, but they don't have any connection with this god. But I went to meet them. Uh, when I was doing my research, but um, but yeah, oh. she she's about eighty eight, I think. Uh, so she was okay. she was uh, in her thirties when she was initiated. Maybe maybe a bit later, but yeah. uh, okay, seventy four. Okay, okay. Um, I kind of maybe worked out that was your age. <laughs> from but just, um, just as a matter of interest, the, the TV people said we're very very lucky that you survived all this and that you're still alive because. We think it's important that your story gets out on TV, that people understand, because nobody understands what 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 went down here. You know? Yeah, and it's a very, I actually I just feel very sad. Actually, I feel really sad uh, when you were just mentioning just now about uh, Kirtanananda. Uh, I I felt quite emotional because of uh, the abuse that he put people through, and. Uh, so I just feel very sad that a movement that so many of us had committed our lives to, uh, as I say, has such a, a terrible history, but it, unfortunately it's still happening today. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. I haven't, yeah. I haven't really spoken out about my experiences in, in ISKCON. Maybe I will one day, <laughs> maybe a TV interview. Uh, I know a lot of secrets about a lot of people in high positions of authority in ISKCON in the UK, which which might come out at some point. Um, OK, um, I want to move on to the last question and maybe you and I could do a podcast at another point in the future. Um, sure. So the a kind of last question is, um, do, does ISKCON have a future and what does the future of Srila Prabhupada's movement look like? Well, the future of ISKCON, I mean, I have a, a blog, I have like, uh, you know, videos and different things. I get about 5,000 hits per day on my sites. So 
these are a lot of young people and they're interested in moving forward. You know, they understand ISKCON is stuck in a rut and ISKCON's not moving and they want to move forward. They like my idea of being a Prabhupada Nuga and I'm encouraging them just, you know, just, just focus on Prabhupada, read his books and follow him and make him your guru and offer your food to Prabhupada. And this was another important thing. Uh, in 1978, they were offering food to Jayatirtha. And I, I said, wait, you can't do that. I mean, when we were installing deities in India, I was actually one of the people helping install the deities by doing the puja. And Prabhupada personally told me, if you do any of this wrong, it will not be accepted by Krishna. You can't make any mistake. This food has to be offered in this process. So it has to be offered to a pure devotee. So if you offer the food to a contaminated person, it contaminates the food. And that explains why so many people became, you know, Jaitirthaites, you know, they, they all got into drugs and sex and, because they were eating food offered to drugs and sex, you know. And I have a friend who's a witch and she says, yeah, you, you offer food to Satan and it Satanizes the food and it harms people. So if you offer food to pedophiles, what's going to happen? It's going to contaminate people. And this is on purpose. They're doing this on purpose. They want to have people eat food offered to pedophiles. She she's explained all this to me. Mm. <laughs> Can you just but anyway, it, the future it, is everybody has to get out of all this stuff and just follow Prabhupada. That's the future. And it's happening. We have, you know, Bangalore is doing it. <laughs> like you say, there's different uh Prabhupada Nugas, you know, here, there, and everywhere. And mm. in, in, in Russia and Czechoslovakia and India and uh, no, just it's it's a grassroots thing, but it is happening. Can you just define for our viewers and listeners what what is the definition of Prabhupada Anuga? What does the term actually mean? Well, Anuga just means follower, you know, like Rupanuga. So just follow Prabhupada. You know, he is your Acharya. He is your link. And some people have criticized, well, you, you, you're giving a Christian idea. Well, yeah, it is a Christian idea. The Christians worship Jesus. And that's why, you know, when Prabhupada was asked, is Jesus still taking the sins of the followers now, 2,000 years later? He said, yes, he is. Jesus is still taking the sins now. He is their guru now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, Prabhupada is the person who's going to absolve your sins Diksha means divyam jnanam, which destroys sins. That's what the word diksha means. So the, who's that person who's going to give you divyam jnanam, which is going to destroy your sins? It's got to be a pure devotee because no one else has that potency. You know, never mind, they don't have the <clears throat> potency to, to engage you in Krishna's leela, you know, or your rasa with Krishna or all the rest of it. They, they have no potency to give any of that stuff. Mm. does that make sense it, it makes complete sense uh i kind of knew the answer i was just wanted you to answer it for <laughs> people uh so it's not me but i i agree with you in terms of what we're seeing around iskon and the wider Hare krishna movement now in terms of that kind of organic grassroots uh mm -hmm. desire that people have to follow Prabhupada. I, I mean if you a sociologist or hit or a historian uh would i, I would like to I would think that what you're seeing now in ISKCON is similar to the 80s. There was a real growth in the Prabhupada Nuga movement in the 80s because of what was happening within the institution of ISKCON, you know, in terms mm -hmm. of all the gurus falling and the gurus doing bad things. And I think right. now, I mean, if you, you and I think you and I are both members of the Vedic Inquirer Facebook group, and you right. see just what's coming out with all this child abuse yeah. and uh, all this molestation over 40 years of innocent people. Right. Uh, and you think, I, I think I'm just kind of sitting back and I'm watching to see what happens. In, in, and all of a sudden, you know, um, we're finding out the, the true story about a lot of these gurus that are behind the scenes abusing people sexually, physically. Right. And um I think what we're going to see, and I'm just as a kind of, a, I'm interested in sociology. We're going to see a growth again now in the Prabhupada Nuga movement because mm -hmm, people yeah. just, they want to feel spiritually safe. And the only place they can do that is to just take shelter of Prabhupada. Well, I, I have friends in ISKCON 
you know, I mean, I have people writing me, they're, they're doing puja at the, at an ISKCON temple somewhere, and they say, what should I do? And I said, just stay there. But when you make the offering, offer everything in the process given by Prabhupada, you know, just be a Prabhupada Nuga. And you know, I, I don't advise people to just, you know, uproot them themselves from wherever they are, just stay where you are and, and, you know, follow his process. And, and they are. So I have people in ISKCON, they distribute books, they, do puja, they do different things, and they like me and what I'm doing, and they read my my stuff, and they agree with, with what I'm promoting. Mm. It's fascinating. Well, I'm I'm pleased that we we both find the time to commit to this podcast, um, because I've I've been aware of your work for some time. Uh, I've seen your valid contributions online to uh, the debate around child protection and just taking shelter of Prabhupada. Um, and uh, yeah, the time zone wasn't a different, wasn't an issue. <laughs> the time difference, sorry, wasn't an issue, uh, mm-hmm. which is good. Um, so um, believe it or not, we've been recording the podcast for about an hour, 20 minutes, um, okay. which is which is great. So I think what I'll do, I'll say goodbye to everyone at home and you and I can have a bit of a debrief after um but i think maybe in the future we can certainly record another podcast um yeah we're just getting started really i i agree and i'm looking forward to seeing <laughs> seeing some of these documentaries that you are involved with in the past yeah. and in the future yeah. uh and um yeah so i'll just say goodbye to everyone watching and listening and you and i can have a bit of a chat after so thank you everyone to tuning into this week's edition of the Harry Christians in Britain podcast. It's been great to have Paranjana uh, as our guest. Uh, his story and his experiences in the Harry Krishna movement are phenomenal. And I hope that you've all learned something about some of these kind of things that have happened in the movement over the last 40 years. Um, I'm, I'm someone who really believes strongly in learning from the past and moving forward. And it's, it's productive and positive to criticize. Self-criticism is really helpful. And, uh, you know, I have friends in the Church of England who campaign against child abuse in the Church of England. It doesn't mean that they're anti-Church of England. It just means they're trying to make the Church of England better for for themselves and for children and for anyone who wants to be part of that community. And those of us within the Hare Krishna movement um, are trying to do the same. We want to make sure that this movement stays focused on Prabhupada. So um, if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook, please do put a positive comment. Please do like, love or care for it. Um, Please do share this link with your friends and your family and your groups and the pages and everything else you're connected to on social media. And until next week's edition, I'll see you all soon. Thank you. Hare Krishna.